Hello and welcome to episode 80 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my life's dream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And to kick off, I want to say thanks for all the love for the podcast, as always. Don't forget to head to my website to find out more about my guests, along with details about our very first live show at the Cockpit Theatre in London, Sunday, March the 13th. It'll be great to see you there. Now, on this episode, I'm joined by the fabulous force of nature that is Nicole Nodland. Not only was she personal photographer to global superstar Prince, living at Paisley Park, touring the world with the band and documenting his life on photo and film, but her portfolio includes icons such as Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, George Clinton, and more recent artists such as Lana Del Rey, Sam Smith, and Dua Lipa. Nicole entered the world of Paul Weller around True Meanings, taking that super cool shot for the album cover, and she's worked with Paul through other aspects and on Sunset. So we talk about all of that and, of course, the mega talent that was Prince on this episode of the podcast. So let's get into it. Nicole Nodlin, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. It's exciting. Oh, well, no, not as excited as I am, I have to say, because this is going to be really interesting, really exciting. Obviously, it's the Paul Weller fan podcast, so we're going to get into some of that stuff in a sec. And when you first became aware of Paul Weller and how your journey as a photographer eventually landed on his scene, where did this love of the lens start from you? Presumably, this was at a very young age, was it? That's a nice question. Yeah, it was from a very young age, in fact. I used to do terrible things to my friends. I would have them I'd do makeovers on them. <laughs> We'd before and after pictures so I would you know do like the worst photo of you know them looking terrible I was probably about eight or nine or whatever and then I would do their hair and makeup and cut their hair I would do the whole works and then I would have them model for me and then I just became obsessed I loved the idea of like you know interacting with people and your friends and then it kind of became a thing even my mom's friends would come over and said can you do something as well and then I started taking pictures of my family's friends and everything and then it just went from there and presumably this is much like some of the photographers that we've had on the podcast before presumably this was an age where you were having to send off and get these films developed or was this all digital oh no no this was oh this was all film <laughs> okay so you take the photo and you're not really sure what you got until you send it off and get it back right right and then and it wasn't until, you know, I decided what I wanted to do. I thought, you know, I definitely want to be a photographer. Kind of figuring out what I'm going to do. I was, my whole life was ballet. So I thought I was going to be a ballet dancer. I wasn't meant to be a ballet dancer. Cut to the chase. I, then I ended up in Arizona State University to kind of thaw out from the quote because I was living in Minnesota. <laughs> you know, I was doing the safe route. You know, my parents were very supportive, but they were also saying, you know, photography and dancing, ballet, it's a hobby. You've got to, you know. So after about a, a year of that, I realized, you know what? No, I'm going to move to California and be a photographer. Wow. <laughs> that was my hard going, very, very difficult years. Moving to LA, did you have a plan? Did you have a plan of action in terms of how this would work? No plan. <laughs> no plan. <laughs> Other than I knew I wanted to do that for a living. That was what I knew. I just, I don't know. I had that thing and I was lucky. A lot of people kind of 17 are still trying to figure out 18, 19, trying to figure out and it took me a few years, but by the time I was 18, I realized I'm going to hell or high water. I'm going to become a photographer and I paid a you know, hefty price for it. <laughs> And we'll talk about how this kicks off because it's a really interesting story of how this this career launched. But I have to understand when it was that you first became aware of the man that is Paul Weller. I was introduced to Paul's music. You know, I knew the jam, the style console. The style console for me was that time where, I don't know if, even if you know that video where he was just like, you know, the best thing that's ever happened. You know, and I kind of felt a little bit, I had a little bit of a crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was just like, in a, you know, he was just that video and the song, it had the soul and it really resonated with me. So I don't know, the universe is so wonderful how it manifests things because I did play that over and over and over. You must have and, loved the video for Long Hot Summer where, he, where he's oh topless, topless like. <laughs> Your face. I'm going to be so embarrassed. <laughs> you need to keep a level of professionalism here. <laughs> But I definitely was crushing on him in those days. Oh, uh, brilliant. I'm sure he's very familiar with that. So we're crushing on Paul Weller and we'll catch up in a second in terms of how you st- how you started to work with him as well. But let's let's go back to the day. And I'm, am I right in thinking you were pretty broke and kind of about to call it a day in terms of I being a pretty, photographer? No, I was never going to call it a day. I just, okay. I knew I knew this in my heart, in my head. I knew 
knew that this was what I had to do. I can't be an accountant. I can't be a secretary. I knew I had to be like, you know, have my freedom and independence and be self-employed. I can't really do much else. I can do other things, but this is what I wanted to do. And yeah. you know how some people can just like be everything, but I just, that, that was it for me. And when I'm on a shoot or when I'm shooting, I'm kind of impervious to cold, pain, hunger, fear, whatever I, you know, you're living your best self. So I thought there's got to be a way other people do this. Why cannot I do that? You know, this is a really brave thing that you did. Was it like cycling over to Paisley Park? And, and oh. <laughs> <laughs> tell me the story. This is brilliant. I fell in love with this Israeli man when I was in, living in L.A. I decidedly made an effort to say, yeah, OK, I'll be with you. So. He called up my parents. They said, so basically, I'm going to move to Israel. And they said, when? And they you're crazy. And I said, tomorrow. <laughs> so I was there. And i that's kind of actually the first professional jobs I did. I was working for a few magazines there. I had a good uh, run there. And then it just didn't work out. So then I moved back to L.A. But everything that I owned was simply gone. The roommate, you know, everything was just gone. My car, everything that I owned. I had a suitcase full of summer clothes and a camera. What am I going to do now? So I called my mom. I said, you know, I have a suitcase and a camera. Can I come regroup and have some respite and try to figure out what I'm going to do? She said, I'll give you two weeks. And I said, great. Thank you. No, not sarcastically. (laughs) That was actually honest. Because that gave me the incentive and the motivation to say, all right, I'm in Minnesota, back where I started. I left when I was, you know, 16. What can I do? And obviously the obvious answer was Prince. He's a local, right? But presumably he wasn't just out and about all the time and you bump, everybody would bump into him in the street doing his shopping. Oh, no, 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 no. No, exactly. So. I called up a few other people just for A, B, C, D, E. Um, I called up Flight Time, Terry Jim. I called up another advertising agency and I called up somebody else who happened to be in town. Nobody responded other than... Princess Kemp. They called me and said, come down, show us your book. You know, portfolio, old school. Yeah. We might be looking for a photographer. Come down, show us your book. So I drove out to Paisley Park. And this is oh, Prince's HQ. Much the, way, much the same way as Black Barn is Paul Weller's Paisley HQ. Park. This is Prince's Paisley. HQ, but massive, I imagine. Is it huge? Huge. Yeah, yeah. huge. This was Prince's uh, Paisley Park. I got there during the day and no security. I just kind of went and then found the person that had actually asked to request to see my book and interview me. And then she said, can I keep your book to show the boss? And I went, yes, absolutely. The boss, meaning Prince, whatever. But at that time, he wasn't Prince. He was, it was a more unpopular era. (laughs) Oh, this is the symbol time, right? This is the symbol. So then I said, absolutely, keep the book. So then my mom and I are just in our pajamas. We'd just eaten like a whole shed load of food. And then, so my mom and I are just relaxing. I Like, this is day two, right? I'm home for day two. And I thought, I got to get on this, you know? So the phone rings close to midnight. She was like, who could that possibly be? And I went, no, 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 no. I tried to run to the phone faster. And she was like, hello. And I went, <laughs> she said, uh, it's him. It's, it's they want. And I said, oh, my. So I was like, grab the phone from her. I was like, hello. And then that was it. They said, he liked your whatever. And he would like to have you come and do a, a shoot. And I said, that's fantastic. This is so exciting. Great. When when are we going to do this? And they're like, hello, tonight, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you're having to go down there straight away. You're in your pajamas. <laughs> I'm like, okay. This was like, for me, a dream. I... You know, remember the era, it was Michael over Prince, Michael Prince, Michael Prince. From a very young age, even before people knew Prince, I and my parents would smash up the, you know, no, you can't listen to this salacious music. And I was like, no, this is incredible. And then, like, finally, they let me keep 1999. Again, it was like the universe manifested this. I put in my purple socks for good luck. And I drove out to Paisley. No security. It was all lit up in purple. And some guy asked me, are you here to see the boss? This is like 1 a.m. in the morning. And I said, yeah, down there. Then I went there and he was in recording studio A. And then that was it. You know, it was his first in-house photographer at Paisley, which was amazing. He wow. hired me to be there and it was incredible. And then I said, I'm going to be a fashion photographer and I moved to New York. And then, but you know, I did go back and forth even before he passed. He, he called me five months before he passed away. And I hadn't talked or seen 
seen him for 10 years at that point. And I was so excited because I thought, oh, it just felt like a relief, you know, because he was so fundamental in my, you know, he was the first one to believe in me, give me a chance. And I don't want to get too emotional, but it's still hard. It's still hard to kind of come to terms with because my office was right, you know, right across from the elevator where he died. There's a lot of little stories and it was like so nice being part of that kind of communal. And now that I'm like completely self-employed, I had missed that. I had missed that part. So I thought, yeah, if this means I go back into the fray and whatever and do that, why not? I'd love to do that. So they just kept having me hold on and hold on. And then they said, he's not ready yet, but the the theme is pirates. So make your mood boards and do your thing. I thought, oh my God, it's exactly like back in the old days because his office was right upstairs from me. And then they said, go home. And then I found out through a text, my phone was beeping off the charts pager. You know, the beeping was just going. And I thought, what is happening? And then I realized this is some horrible people saying print is dead oh. and then i realized oh my god you know i mean so, oh, such a sad loss right and but the sorry to go there oh, and, I'm, and i'm sorry to take you there this is an artist who much the same as paul is like hugely prolific in the amount of material that he has yeah. created and was constantly in the studio recording because he lived in the studio i guess it's the same in terms of photography so you know if he wants yeah. to make a record he'd get put yeah. everybody together if he wants you to do a photo shoot suddenly it's like you know quick quick take the photos yeah and paul was like so you know he has that um thing too i you know after i got out of the hospital two weeks later i was shooting him and i didn't tell them anything because i thought you know why would I, you know, but he was so gentle and charismatic and wonderful. And he said, I think he, I don't know, but he mentioned something about Prince and we talked a little bit about it. And he said, oh, and so, yeah, so there's definitely a connection with Paul and Prince. They would have gotten along like a house on fire. Because when ultimately with Paul, it all comes down to the music, doesn't it? There's no yeah. doubt at all that Prince was, I mean, ridiculously talented in terms of the amount of instruments the he Paul, could play. Paul, Paul yeah. Is, yeah, the two of them, you feel like there's, there would have been that connection, absolutely. They um, would have gotten along and because, you know, Prince, you could not put him in a box, you know? You do jazz, then you do funk, then you do try to do hip hop, then you try to do rap, then you do soul. And then, but he actually, it was undefinable. It was like he made his own. Every time they would crush him, and the ratings would be so bad and they would laugh at him. And he'd say, I don't care. I'm someone else now. I'm doing this. He taught me that. He taught me, you know, that you know, to just be authentic to yourself, what you're doing, and not worry about the critics. Just be true and just be free. Now, the Weller connection. So so you get a phone call from Paul's team. They're obviously yeah. aware of your work. And, and this is not just Prince, by the way, folks. This is everything from Stevie Wonder to Ray Charles to Lana Del Rey to Ed Sheeran, Sinead O'Connor, John Legend. Uh, the, the, the list is endless. And of course, Paul's really into his fashion, really into his style as well. A massive part of his makeup as well. So your portfolio really stands out in that space too. We're talking clients like Gucci, for goodness sake, you know, Vogue, Chanel, Armani. It just turns up. It's no problem. There's no people. There's no entourage. There's just him and his suitcase and his beautiful face and hair. And he's solid. He's content. He's peaceful. He gives you peaceful vibes. I think he must have, like, I don't understand how he knew after, you know, the brain surgery, but he would gently take my hand and walk me across the street. I'm like, what? You know, I'm here for you, whatever, you know, because you think of him as like quite. Paul Weller, like, you know, a bit. I don't really know the culture as much as I... Bit of a, bit of a geezer, right? Yeah. Right. But he is, like, the most gentleman, like, you can imagine, like, the dream. And what was the job? What was the first job for? Was it a magazine shoot or was it the album shoot? I think that was the album. That was right. The album. So this is here. Where, where are we? This is... There we are. True Meanings. Yeah, that's... Yeah. The, that was, yeah, yeah, that was the first shoot we did. Right. So this is True Meanings, the album cover. Controversial album cover because Paul's got a fag in his hand, which I think... <laughs> did, did, didn't I have to get airbrushed for some of the posters? We bonded over that, though. You'd be like, let's go smoke. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favourite people that I've ever shot. A true icon, legend, but just gentleman, authentic person. I felt safe. I felt secure. And he trusted me. And it was like, 
you know, because I had a little bit of beforehand, like saying, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. You might have only this much time and you hear this stuff and you think, okay, but at the same time, you know, I said, well, why don't we do this? And he said, you do what you want. You're Nicole fucking Nodland. <laughs> oh, wonderful. You're Nicole effing Nodland. Love it. And at this point, did you know it was going to be the album cover? No, no. Oh. I just, I was just trying my best at that point. I was just like, this is what I do. I've got this. Yeah, sure. I'm two weeks out of brain surgery, but I can do this, whatever. And I, I wanted to create something fresh and not pastiche and... I don't know. I, I know that we have so much further to go. And was it a black bar? Was it at Paul Weller's HQ then? This was just at uh, Shoreditch Studios. Okay. He and his little mini couldn't find it. And I was like, I don't blame you because we live literally <laughs> five minutes away from each other. We could have taken a taxi and would have to get... Could have popped around. <laughs> we to go to East London to do this. And then after that point, there's a few connections a few other connections on the next album so there's also the royal festival hall were you the photographer for that gig yes i was three days wow it was awesome it was unbelievably awesome to see you know that's when i got to know the band and and i got to kind of get in there and like figure it out and amalgamate you know the world of what i knew about paul and everybody was so incredibly lovely they were like Ugh, and it was so exciting. I just kind of, we just ran around the Royal Festival Hall like it was our playground. <laughs> <laughs> and you were there for part of the rehearsals and then the two concerts oh, themselves, were the you? Time. The whole time, yeah. Oh, my word. Wow. Everybody had their own room and I was part of it, like as if I was part of the band. <laughs> <laughs> part very, of the crew. Lovely. And when you're taking those photos, how much of the concert are you actually able to enjoy versus this is a job I need to I need to get the right shot? This is, this is a very good question. Thanks. <laughs> You're really smart. You're very good. That's that's the hard part is when yeah. you're there and you go, okay, so like for Prince, you do the gig, you do the after gig, you do the after after gig, and you do the after after gig. And yeah. you're just like, yeah. oh. he's, st- he's still going by six in the morning, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. And then like he doesn't turn up. And it's like, I guess I had that. I, I knew what it was like to try to put that aside and to say, get the shot, be the hunter, do this. Stop engaging and just separate yourself and do what you are supposed to do. But it's hard emotionally because you get engaged. Whatever. So by by this point, I guess 30 years on, I was able to do that. I told my assistant, you get, you know, behind the stage. We had to crawl up. We had to make friends with the people at Royal Festival Hall. You get behind. I'll get in front. So you get the whole band bowing from behind, you know, the crowd, and then I will do the front part or vice versa. It doesn't matter. So, you know, you kind of learn shit. You kind of learn things. And what is it that you're looking for? So on those live shoots, it's, I mean, it's very different to being in a studio, obviously. So those tours, those concerts, those gigs, what is it that you're looking for on those live performances? Just through a moment. And I, I don't know. I mean, like, can you imagine the disparity between a Prince gig and Paul Weller? Prince was like chaos, right? Chaos. You don't know where. I mean, like every day, every night, you'd say, "Did you get the shot?" I'd be like, "No." The shot being finally, he told me, "When I take my belt off, that is mean when I stage dive into the crowd." Oh, that was the one he was looking so for. So every day I was tormented. Did I get that shot? And every day I didn't. For some <laughs> reason, the camera just like said no. The first time I got the shot, we're in Monte Carlo. All posh people. The river parted. The crowd parted. Oh no! <laughs> so he dives, and the crowd moves and separates. Great on his fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time I got the shot. You've got that shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> Paul Weller, like easy. What? Yeah. I don't know if he's ever been a big stage diver. No, no. no. So, stage, I mean, right? they, you know, if you can handle Prince, you can yeah. handle anybody. It's like you've done the SAS training, right? So you, you've passed that and yeah, now you're on. You know what I mean? It sounds crazy, but probably, yeah. Yeah. Is that, and then you're in support. What the fuck's happening here? Those concerts were I mean, magical. I have to say, I love them. I love the album as well. I think it's a really what solid. What is your uh, favorite really Prince song? Cream and Get Off and that period when it was oh, wow. um, and Diamonds and Pearls that album and the one after it what was the album it was, it was Symbol was it or Love Symbol that album yeah that period for me was because it was like what? 
92, 93, something like that, maybe? No, a bit earlier. 91. Yeah, I reckon. Get off. Get off. That one. And sexy MF and all that. You sexy motherfucker. Yeah. That was great. But I love all the like Purple Rain. I love Sign of the Times. Okay, so we need to go there. I need to introduce you to proper... What should I be listening to in the, in the world of Prince? Something that will like make you shake in your body solo. Is that a song or an album? Let's play it now. Are you going to put Let's it on now? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. It's a song, Dan. Sorry, I don't know what album what was on I this song. I love you so hard right now. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this. So low, the curve looks like a skyscraper. Which album is this from? I have no idea. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. People don't normally react positively to this. Oh, this is off the album. Maybe, Come. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't okay. properly react positively. And I think because it disturbs them. But at the same time, this is important. Well, this was when he was still known as Prince, wasn't it? This was the last one before. <laughs> but this is what he had to offer. 27 instruments to play at 13. And, inc- and not just play, I mean, incredible at all of them as well. Like as a guitarist, it was like, I, I, right I, there, right? I, won't, I won't do much more, but this is it. Listen. <laughs> The other thing with Prince and Paul, both incredible guitarists. Yeah, I mean, incredible. They're like Prince and Paul. They're my favorite people to ever have shot in my life. And I'm very grateful for both of them. At times with Paul, the photography has had to get a little into it, right? Because you're you're right up close. You're having to get into somebody's face. Wasn't there a moment where you had to straddle him to take a photo? Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that was part of it. He That's part of the thing. He had to trust you because they said, no, no, no. It was exactly like Prince. I had already had the army drill training saying like, you know, don't look him in the eye. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. But I do know that I'm just a human and you're just a human. And when we can trust each other and say, look, I'm not going to do anything you don't want to do and whatnot. Uh, yeah, the straddling point was just like, they were like, <laughs> shock, like horror. And I'm like, guys, please, because I'm also a fashion photographer. Yeah. You can be like, let's get, let's do this, you know? And actually, it's when you talk about fashion, I mean, Paul Paul loves his fashion, loves his clothes. He's amazing. Yeah. He has so much taste. His taste is impeccable. Impeccable. Like, I would never dare challenge whatever he chooses to wear. Paul, again, he was just like, this is me. I am this and nobody can touch this. And I was like... I could never do any better than what you've just chosen as your thing. Mm. It was so beautiful. And then his, you know, children came and helped steam the clothes. And I was like, oh, that's so fun, you know? 2020, we had another album from Paul. I mean, the hit rate and the amount of productivity, the amount of material coming out of Paul and out of Black Barn Studios is, is incredible over the past few years. But we had the album on Sunset and you had to go to LA for the shoot for that. Was that right? I didn't have to. I was going. <laughs> well, yeah. I was like, hell yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> That's my second home. <laughs> that was where, you know, that's where, from where I left and that was my home. So I know LA inside and out and it was like, this is meant to be what not. But my right thinking you were there for because your shots coincide with the video as well. So you were there on the shoot for the video too. Is that right? They did an excellent job. The video was beyond. I was just the extra shooting the stills on the video. I mean, I just spent three days just shooting. I mean, like for me, I was so like, oh my God, this is a video. I just need to get what I can. And it was beautiful. I just took the behind the scenes and he gave me all the time and he said, do you want to do more? And I was like, okay, well, if you're not stressed out, he was like, no, I'm giving it all. I have so many photos from that three days in LA and his the car and the thing. And it was just a beautiful. And I got to meet his son and the son's boyfriend who directed the video. And it was incredible. He did an amazing job. They amalgamated the worlds of what I'd already done on Sunset. They told me the the visuals and I don't know, somehow it came together. If I can say one thing about Paul is he's a proper gentleman, a proper person. He remembers when he asks you questions, like you say, 
how do you even remember that? He said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And you know, it's not just like bullshit. You just go, oh my God, that's incredible. You know, I would do anything for him. I mean, that album screamed summer to me from when it came out. It, it, it was a real kind of up, sunshiny album. We were in the UK. I think we were either just coming out of lockdown, maybe, or still in lockdown. It still felt I think like it was pretty crap. Still wasn't lockdown it? at that point. Yeah. And it was just what we needed, wasn't it? It was, you know, absolutely. Yes, it, was. it was so beautiful. It was like, nostalgic painful but also like positive you know that album because i hadn't heard the music and then that album every song became my favorite song i had that on repeat 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 i was like oh my god i'm so lucky that must be so cool though when you get the i've got the vinyl here when you get the vinyl and you kind of open up all the record you open up and there's your there we are there's your shots inside you know (laughs) i have not i don't even have that oh you don't have this oh it's brilliant no show me again there you go look well (laughs) no i don't is that my thumb in the picture (laughs) No, that's my thumb. That was my thumb. I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> You're not that bad. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> give give yourself some much. credit, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that must be so special when knowing that your shots are on the front cover. I feel very yeah. lucky because it's not just about like, it's just who he was after I got out of, you know, and he treated me and he was so gentle and kind and charismatic. He's an angel. What is it about these artists, these musicians, the, the ones that are successful and, and really successful that makes them stand apart, do you think? You've got Prince. But what when we talk about Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, George Clinton, people like that, what do you think it is that stands them apart from others? I don't know. I guess like even with Stevie, it was like I had that opportunity because of Prince, Stevie... And Prince were very good friends. You think like, oh, no, I'm not worthy. But then these people actually are like giving you the time and you think, I can't believe this, you know? It's amazing because when you try to go, like, to try to figure out what you want to do, be a photographer and you reach, I had this magazine for a short amount of time, incremental amount of time. I reached out to the lower people. It was only the upper echelons of all the Magnum photographers that said, yes, 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 yes. And Prince taught me that. He said, no, stop. Just embrace who you are. You're authentic and the universe will understand that. Guess who's coming into town? And I said, who? It'd be every day. It would be like an adventure. I want you to meet my friend, Nona. And I said, who's Nona? She said, Marvin Gaye's daughter. You're going to get along like a host in fire. And I said, yes, I'm super excited. And then we found out we were born on the same day, September 4th, whatever. And then he said, you and Nona are going to get along. And I said, great. So we're sending you off to Las Vegas for two weeks. And I went, all right. <laughs> So we did a photo shoot of her on roller skates and whatever and said, girl, I like you. Do you want to go on this trip to Vegas with me? Because that's what's happening here. She said, yeah, I'm all in. Wow. Oh, my word. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, music videos as well. It's not just the photography, but you've also directed yeah, videos. Okay. And, and that's like a, a mixture of stuff, which is fashion, beauty, music. And we're talking music videos for some real talent as well. People like Grace Carter and Dua Lipa and Lana Del Rey. And there is a Weller connection, actually, with Coltrane. Because you directed one of his videos. So Coltrane was on, actually, it was on Sunset, wasn't it? Yeah, the song Earthbeat. Yeah, the song Earthbeat features Coltrane, the hip-hop R&B artist. But you directed one of his videos a while back, yeah? Yeah, because he's a talented. But I literally was like, all right, so we have one day to shoot this. It's fine. We'll do the woods and whatever. He told me his whole thing. And he's so talented. I love him to bits and I work with his management I or used to Lana Del Rey, Dua Lipa, Coltrane. That's why I met Coltrane because of Lana. She wasn't even signed. Nobody would touch her. They were like, no, 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 you're not ready yet. I was the first one. Her name was still Elizabeth Grant at that point. Anyway, skip to 10 years later, I'm shooting Coltrane. I said, I feel like we're missing something. And for some reason, I decided to do this underwater tank. I had done, my first video was Prince Dolphin. And it's so embarrassing. You can tell. It's like. <laughs> I feel that you don't feel that's your finest work. <laughs> okay, fair enough. One, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was based on the photo shoot that I was already doing. And then all of a sudden he said, this isn't going to just be a photo shoot. This is going to be a video. I'm like, 
Ah! You've clearly learned a lot since then <laughs> in terms of the I music also videos. Got so. to do the thing. I took the camera and I decided to go for it. Yeah, that was my first video. Yeah, I have to be honest. Out of all the Prince videos, that's the one I don't remember so much. <laughs> no, no disrespect. No, please, for the love of God. But to be fair. My mom and I made that angel custom for my day, the crown. I'm like, see, I've been doing the flower crowns for a long time. And my first shoot of Lana was with the flower crowns. I'm like, girl, I've been doing that flower crown forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing, when you talk about that, one of the things about Paul is he's a huge, big supporter of new music, new artists, young artists coming through. And that discovery of yours then with Lana Del Rey and you mentioned Dua Lipa, people like that. I mean, the it seems to me there's so much talent around these days as well, right? I love Lana. I love Dua. They're amazing. My new cat is Jacob Willier. Okay, so Daniel, hold on. You just like, I need a cigarette. Because if you don't know this cat, you're losing out. The first time I shot him was for the cover of Billboard magazine. This guy is a proper talent. Jacob Collier. He's one of those people who is okay, let, let's just, do something. just annoyingly talented. <laughs> More than annoying talented. <laughs> That's what I mean. He's like, play, yeah. like, no, I've never met anyone as talented as Prince in terms of playing every single instrument, 27 instruments since the age of 17. But Jacob is one of these characters and you're like wow how is this possible so billboard called me and said we've got this new cat uh, quincy jones productions we'd like you to shoot him and i googled him and i'm like hell yeah so just let's have a look i know of him because he's won a grammy isn't he or a couple of grammys he's won a few like yeah. five or something and not, not only him his mom as well and who's his mom susie who's one of my best friends now oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put detail. This is a good recommendation. I love the recommendation of an artist. No, no, you need to get this in there. These two are like forces to be reckoned with. There's a wonderful video of Jacob where he um that's his connection with Paul. It's a bit tenuous, admittedly, but on Studio 150, Paul's cover versions album from when would that have been? So two, 2004, something like that. He covered Close to You by the Carpenters. Oh my god. And, but then Jacob's has done a video of Close to You where he was basically you have to watch this folks, honestly. He was uh, yeah, he did like it was basically him like overmaps himself on the video like yes, over and over and, and over, doing was, all the backing yeah. vocals, everything, wasn't it? He's such a yeah, such a talent. And annoying because he's like 28 or something ridiculous. No, he's 27. Oh, for fuck's sake, he's not even as old as I thought he was, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody annoying. Right. This has been so great, Nicole. Um, I've loved every second of speaking to you. I have two final questions for you, okay? You're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the jam, the style council or so. Yeah, she's, shake, she's shaking her head. <laughs> What's it going to be? me what the Prince song could be. There's like Erotic City, Dorothy Parker, Big White Mansion. I mean, how can I choose one Paul Weller song? If you're going to put something on straight after this chat, what would it be? It's too hard, Daniel. Like... <laughs> That's the fact you call me Daniel. Right, let's be honest. Let's be honest. I'm going to shame myself, but no, not because what he did was, you're the best thing that's ever happened. Have you seen the version of him and Boy George doing that at the Barbican? Oh, so I need to hear that. Yeah, you need to dig into that. Right. My final question is always the same. The purpose of this podcast is not least to meet to ama uh, meet amazing people like yourself who have connections to Paul, but amazing careers that we can dig into as well. But it's also for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. Well, we will do this. I will ask him and I'll say, he lives five minutes down the road. <laughs> I will go and get him. Go and knock. I can hang on. Go and knock on his door. Bring him round. We'll do it here. What should I ask him if it happens, Nicole? Don't ring him now. <laughs> Don't ring him now. <laughs> I'm so tempted to but I know it's not <laughs> what should I ask him I guess the question I don't know what the question would be but I would say like how old is he now 63 I think and he's like completely like and he's got 100 kids he's amazing he's a gentleman he's so so I don't know I don't know more of a grateful attitude thank you Paul because you brought me out of St. Mary's Hospital, and I knew that I had to get out. He doesn't probably even know that. But similarly, like Prince, he unknowingly or unwittingly kind of gave me the incentive to save my life and to do what I had to do to do the shoot and just be like, you know what? It's all a mindset. You've got this. Paul Willer, you're amazing. And he proved to me more than anybody, you know, being the gentleman, the human. It was, you know, because I was scared. I thought, you know, I'm American. I don't quite get the. He was such a such a savior, and so I guess 
just saying like you've changed someone's life and he has definitely helped me but the, i don't know what the question would be do you know what it was that made him want you for the true meanings projects for the on yeah, sunset no idea. You- no idea that's a beautiful thing when you can be on a shoot and you can say look you're in safe hands I don't know if he knew I was Prince's photographer. I don't know. I don't think he did. He just felt safe. And it was that was what made me feel so comfortable to be able to say he just said, whatever, whatever you want to do. The amount of pictures I have of him, for example, the last three day shoot we did in L.A. It was just like and then, you know, his friend Max turns up and he's like, I've got this. It's just beautiful. I love that. This is Max Beasley, the actor. Max right? Beasley, yeah. Max was part of the Paul Weller band, very early 90s, right at the beginning, the Paul Weller movement. And Max, I'm delighted to say, is going to be coming on the podcast as well. I didn't even know that. Yeah, he had like an amazing career as a session musician for a while, but played keys and percussion in the band as well. My and, bad. Uh, but, uh, well, no, I don't think many people know. But yeah, now he's like a proper Hollywood actor, right? Yeah. You're in the company of, you know, and it's intimidating, but immediately you just feel like, fine. And he he gave me the permission. He said, look, you're Nicole, whatever you want to do. Nicole, this has been so fabulous. I've loved chatting with you. It's been a joy to spend time in your company. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Lots of love. Well, that was a real blast. What a joy to spend time in the company of Nicole Nodland on this episode of the podcast. So many amazing, brilliant stories. Check out more details on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this episode of the pod, please share on your social media channels. It really does help us to spread the word. You can get in touch on on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.